Welcome to the Cal Park Bros Podcast. I'm your host, Terrence, and with me is my co-host, Jason, calling in from the back cave in Indianapolis. Jason, now you, my good man. I'm doing very well, sir. It's another lovely Tuesday. Episode 29, bro. 29. I'm hyped for that, as if you couldn't tell. Oh, but yeah, man. Know. Ready to get it in, as always, man. Yes, sir. As far as the podcast goes, anyway. Yes, <laughs> right. Got to got to qualify that. Uh, thank you for listening, folks. This is episode twenty nine, as my man Jason has stated, of the Cal Park Bros podcast. But again, the initiated Cal Park Bros is a weekly podcast for fans of culture, current events, sp- sports, life, and entertainment. We and are the a- podcast to hear. That's right, sir. T H E V. Like a certain university likes to do that, even though. But we are actually the. Got to get the thumb point in there. But as always, folks, we're your hosts, Terrence and Jason. And every single Thursday, we're bringing you a brand new episode where we discuss the current events of the day, sports, and the athletes we love. And even some of the athletes we loathe. No matter the topic, you can expect a brutally honest and fun exchange of snark while learning the th- lens of our 30 years of friendship that originated in Calumet Park, Illinois. Folks, for more Cal Park Bros content, make sure you connect with us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, go there. That's where you can connect with us and also make sure you get behind all the scenes of the show. Between the segments, folks, you know you love it. You want it. But also don't forget that the show is available for free to listen and subscribe wherever you, wherever you listen to podcasts. Like us, love us, share us, follow us. And folks, if you like us, hell, why wouldn't you? That's right. Y'all know the line. Make sure you love it, live it, and do it. Jason, to kick off the show, we're going to talk about um, a sport that, frankly, we haven't talked a lot about. But in reality, it's not really about the sport. It's about the infrastructure of power and the issue with winning at all costs. Uh, In the first segment, we're going to be talking about the National Hockey League and kind of review what happened with the Chicago Blackhawks sexual assault investigation. I am referencing a NBC Chicago article, and I'm going to bring up real quick. And this was published on October 26th. Um, This is something we had in the hopper for at least... Uh, a week ago and frankly we thought okay we're uh, another shoe has yet to drop and um turns out there was there was a lot of action that happened once uh the investigation was deemed complete chicago blackhawks saw the release of a long-awaited investigation to sexual assault allegations major staffing changes and fines in the hockey, national hockey league all in a matter of hours tuesday The Blackhawks hired Jenner and Block, that's a law firm, to conduct what they called an independent review in response to two lawsuits filed against the franchise, one alleging sexual assault by then-assistant coach Brad Aldrich during the team's Stanley Cup run in 2010, and another filed by a former student whom Aldrich was convicted of assaulting in Michigan. The results of that review were were released in a virtual press briefing that included Blackhawks chairman Rocky Wirtz, CEO Danny Wirtz, and lead investigator Reed Shar. Findings were made available to the public shortly after. According to a recent investigation, the encounter between, at that time, John Doe, then 20, and Aldrich, then 27, and a video coach for the Blackhawks, occurred on May 8th or 9th in 2010. Doe told, Do told investigators that Aldridge threatened him with a souvenir baseball bat before forcibly performing oral sex on him and masturbating on the player's back, allegations that he also detailed in the lawsuit. Aldridge told investigators the encounter was consensual. Aldridge left the Blackhawks after the 2009-2010 uh, season. He was sentenced to nine months in prison, not for this uh, first lawsuit, but for the second lawsuit related to the Michigan assault. That assault, by the way, was involving a minor. So, 
there was a lot of blowback after that report came out. Number one, the NHL commissioner, Gary Bettman, said, hey, we're going to have to have a conversation with uh, a few people. One of them was uh, Joel Quinville, who, until that report came out, he had said he wasn't aware of those allegations. He ends up getting, he ends up resigning from his uh, post as the Florida Panthers coach. Uh, so, Jason, I, I've, I've laid a lot on the table just now. There's been a lot of fall, fallout from that report. What are your thoughts, you know, having heard all of this so far? Well, the, the big issue, as you've essentially alluded to by what you said about what uh, Joel Quinville initially stated, was that whenever certain higher-ups, we'll say, within the Blackhawks organization were made aware of the allegations, at least, essentially, they didn't do enough, or some people could say they didn't do anything. Uh, and that's really what the problem is, that they didn't do anything, even though they were made aware. And I made this comparison, again, not that they're exactly the same, but I made the comparison eerily to the Joe Paterno situation at Penn State that happened some number of years ago, where someone witnessed a sexual assault uh, happen on the campus in the locker room. That individual told Joe Paterno, and I guess through investigation, it was deemed that Joe Paterno didn't do enough, so they fired him. Uh, Statues are taken down of Joe Paterno, winds are vacated, things like that. But again, all stemming from the belief that someone who was in a figure of authority didn't do enough. And that's what we see here. The difference is this didn't fall on just one individual. This fell on multiple individuals, Quinville included. Uh, now, the difference, another difference is Joe Paterno didn't deny anything he, he was aware of it he said it and whatnot quinville like you said denied knowing anything about it even though according to the investigation done by the law firm he did know he was even involved in, in a huge meeting with the other individuals that we're uh, going to mention here about the situation and they didn't do anything i listened to uh, an interview done by john doe whose name we're going to talk about he did a tv interview after all this stuff came out and he mentioned something that um, was that brought to his attention when it comes to the findings. I'm sure his lawyers told him that Bowman expressed that Quinville said essentially, and when the John Doe mentioned this in an interview, he was paraphrasing here, not an exact quote, but he said that Quinville basically said that the playoffs and winning the Stanley Cup is more important than sexual assault. Again, not an exact quote per what John Doe said. He did say it's not an exact quote, but paraphrasing, that's what Qu Quinville said. So, obviously I wasn't there when he said it. I didn't see it read on any reports. I'm going off what John Doe said. I'm willing to trust it. And if that's what Qu Quinville said, then you know what? F that guy. So, yeah, that's it. His career, like, like we said with uh, John Gruden uh, a couple of episodes, episodes ago, whenever he got fired from the, excuse me, resigned from the Raiders from what he said in emails years ago, his career is over. Maybe to a lesser degree, Quinville's probably is too. Again, not just making it about Quinville, but obviously he's probably the bigger face in a way of all this because one, he was bigger, bigger on the face, bench. biggest face, biggest name. When you're the when you're the when you're the head coach of a professional franchise, and hell, we can put Joe Paterno into that too, because Penn State's an institution. Um, there there is one thing I will disagree though. It wasn't just Joe Paterno. Joe Paterno was damn near bigger than than, than college football, so of course he's gonna get the heat. When you when you put somebody on a pedestal like that, it's a near godlike status. 
which is how a lot of these programs have college football in the first place. That God had to be slayed. But I don't believe that it was just a Joe Paterno. It was just it wasn't just the lead guy turning his head. Much like you have issues in with sexual assault in these programs. And and outside of these programs, it's often multiple people looking the other way, doing doing a cost-benefit analysis as to whether or not it's okay for this person to be destroyed as collateral damage in the name of winning. Um, Stan Bowman, uh, he was the general manager. Uh, in President of Hockey Operations, he had to go. I mean, pretty much, aside, aside from a few players, and I know Quinville had already uh, moved on, but uh, I think the fact that you had multiple high-profile management position type guys aware of this and look the other way and we're okay basically with this guy holding up that cup I feel a little dirty I'll be honest it's okay to 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 be a a, a sports fan a hockey fan a Blackhawks fan and say you know what this is fucked up this is wrong. Does it tarnish the legacy? I don't know how it couldn't. I don't know. I don't, I, you know, I operate in a realm where I can recognize the amazing accomplishments, three Stanley Cup titles of that in that decade. And also, some missed opportunities to do the right thing. Hang on a second. I want to ask you a question about what you just said. So when you say tarnish the legacy, the legacy of Quinville or the Blackhawks during that, that, that three-cup win run? Both. Both. All. I mean, this the, the, the stench of this goes everywhere. It's following everywhere because everybody knows just enough. When I say everybody, I mean leadership. Just because, you know, to quote uh, Jerry Krause, you know, you got your management winning, cha- you know, bring, putting together teams. The infrastructure. You know, this wasn't because one person was. uh uh a a a criminal it's because this person was a deviant did something non-consensual and had and had to brass basically co-sign into shit this guy's walking but this guy gets his own day with the cup and what's wild is is that john doe outs himself as kyle beach And says that's when he really felt sick to his stomach is that not only what happened to him was horribly fucked up, but also you got this, you got this asshole, uh, Aldrich, walking into high schools and shit. And then literally three years later, they kind of gave him the Catholic Church. Uh, clergy treatment, where it's just like, yeah, we'll just kind of silently let you go and do your own thing. We'll kind of let you kind of like go away on your own. It's yeah, too li- it was too little, too late, dog. Like there, there was a window in time when they could have been like, 
bam, he's got to fucking go. We got to make an example out of him, and here's why. Yeah, I was reading everything, uh, several articles today, and that was one thing that I struck, struck me as kind of odd, that the HR department for the Blackhawks, when it comes to Aldrich, since they gave him the option, they gave him the option to, hey, you get the other option, either we're going to look into this and, and investigate, or you can resign. And obviously, Aldrich resigned. But my thought is, we're not talking about a team violation, like he broke team rules or anything. We're talking about he committed a crime, potentially. But yet you gave him the option to quit or look into it. How about you give him the option to quit or get fired? We're still going to investigate anyway. How about that? You know. So that's not, that's probably extremely odd that a crime was committed, but yet they gave him the option to will you look into it or you can quit. We won't bother with it. Like you said, that's, that doesn't make any sense. But one thing I do want to bring up and go into real quick: we keep mentioning multiple pe- multiple people involved in, in this besides Quinville. I want to read an excerpt. Um, real quick, from the report that the law firm sent to the Blackhawks about their findings. You mentioned earlier that the incident happened either on uh, May uh, 8th or 9th of 2010. So this is directly from the report. On May 23rd, 2010, Blackhawks Senior Director of Hockey Administration, Al McIsaac, was told by a Blackhawks employee that there may have been a sexual encounter involving Aldrich and John Doe, again, Kyle Beach, McIsaac dispatched the Blackhawks mental skills coach and team counselor Jim Gary to speak to John John Doe to gather details of what may have happened. John Doe recalled that uh, he told Gary the details of the encounter, which Aldris had reported uh, them to us during our investigation and as described above. Now, later on May 23rd, within an hour after the Blackhawks won a playoff game that secured their place in the Stanley Cup Finals, Five members of the senior management, then President John McDonough, McIsaac himself, General Manager Stan Bowman, then Executive VP Jay Blunk, and then Assistant General Manager Kevin, uh, whose name I can't pronounce, Shevel Dayhoff, along with then Head Coach Joel Quinville and Gary, met to discuss what had been learned about Aldrich and John Doe. Accounts of the meeting vary significantly, and the participants had limited recollections of the details of the meeting. So I just want to bring that up so we can go out and name and out the people involved in that meeting when it comes to who was aware of the allegations and what happened from there, as we all talked about already. So those were the individuals that were aware of the situation, met about it, and discussed it, and then took the action or lack thereof that they chose, chose to take. But yet Joel Quinville said he didn't know anything about it. In some ways, that's more damning, you know, 11 years later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. So I, I, I know the line here says that, you know, they all, the re- regulation of the meetings all vary depending on the person you talk to who was there. So I guess Joel Quinville just forgot he was there altogether. Nah, I think, <laughs> I don't what? think he forgot. I think he made an egregious, horrible calculation that he didn't think he was going to pay for that lie. Like, Joe Quinville got too much hockey money to be thinking that that shit wasn't going to go down like the Hindenburg. That's 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 my issue. Understood. Understood. Like, like either no comments to shit or just come clean. Because... So to to me, the the cover up is just as bad, if not worse, than the original looking the other way, which is what it appears to be. Under that paragraph I just read, um, read from anyway, uh, continue on just a little bit here. Bowman recalled that during the meeting, McDonough and Quinville made comments about the challenge of getting to the Stanley Cup Finals and a desire to focus on the team and the playoffs. Several years later, McIsaac, uh, McIsaac, in discussing the situation between Aldrich and John Doe with another Blackhawks employee, stated that McDonough did not want any negative publicity during the Stanley Cup playoffs. We all know that when it comes to 
pro organization, and I've been a part of one, two technically, that winning is important from, from the top down, from the general manager, from the people selling the tickets, from the people selling beer in the stands and slinging popcorn at all the kids. Winning is important. They all want the team to win. But I have to imagine the cost to win is going to be different for everybody. Now, obviously, this coming out may or may not, if it come out, may or may not have affected the team winning. But they weren't willing to risk that. And hence, for what you know, Kyle Beach said, that was stated from Quinville, they didn't want to take the risk of getting a negative publicity, put a negative spot on the team, and then taking the risk of not winning that championship, which they did, folks. They, they won. Yeah, so it's, it's like I've been saying for probably the last two episodes, it's all about balance. Yeah, I want to win, but at what cost? I guess that answer is going to be different for me and you as it is for some of these individuals here. So uh, one thing I, I do want to say real quick, and not that we have to end the uh, topic here, but I, one thing I was kind of wondering, and, and this is not to, to diminish what happened to him, but I, I was kind of wondering what, what it was that kind of sparked Kyle to come, up, come forward with this now. Because, again, it happened 11 years ago. Not, not, and obviously he came forward to the team, but as far as coming public with it, what made him want to do it now? And in listening to that interview, he actually brought it up, and I, I didn't think he would. But I believe he was asked why he wanted to come forward, and he said it was because of that what happened to that other individual in Michigan. He said that um, that's why he wanted to come forward, for one, that didn't happen to anybody else. And he did say that he wished that he would have came forward before because it might have prevented that from happening had he did, as far as going public to the, you know, to the world, yeah, not just the black I mean, so, I mean, he came forward. The rest of those motherfuckers – did not. Right. They came, they came forward when the shit was unavoidable. He came forward when it was least convenient for him. So, you know. But that's important, though, too, that, that yeah, he, he, right, he did come forward pr- pretty quickly, too, when it comes to telling somebody that happened. Told the team. They didn't do anything about it. And that, and that, that could have prevented him and from coming forward to the world, he's like, well, if they don't give a, give a damn, why would anybody else? And that's probably the decision a lot of other people who get sexually assaulted had to make. I came forward to somebody, that didn't do any good, so I'm not saying nothing to nobody else. So, again, obviously not blaming Kyle Beach for this. Unfortunately, it happened to somebody else by the same altered individual, you know, and that's what uh, prompted Kyle to come forward. So, kudos to him for doing it. I'm sure that's a brave thing. He definitely got very emotional during the interview that I watched, and uh, totally understandable. Um, but that's the damage that can cause the people when they are, you know, taking advantage of like that. And here, here's a big, big, strong, tough, professional male athlete playing this tough sport of hockey. So it, it doesn't matter who you are. So people need to keep that in mind that that's what happens to people when they are sexually assaulted. So, so definitely when those allegations come out, it should be taken seriously when it comes to looking into and going from there. I'll say that. And I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, Jason. I think it's very it's very difficult. It makes me think about it. every time we've heard stories of men and women who have, especially when they get asked that question, well, why are you talking about it now? I'm like, I'm here's a thought. I'm trying to pre- I'm trying to prevent the next fucking victim from even becoming a victim which is more than what I can say for these other assholes. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to clarify that when I, when I was said I was thinking that, it's not like I was thinking, about why are you coming out with it now as opposed to, well, I don't believe you, more as a thing of, well, since he kept it hidden for 11 years, what sparked him to come out with it now? And he gave his answer right there, which makes perfect sense. You know, I'm sorry he felt like he had to wait this long, and I'm sorry it took someone else getting hurt by the same individual but like I said, he came forward so it didn't happen to a third person by this individual. So um, so I will say this to anybody else who's listening to this. You know, if you kind of find yourself in the same situation similar to Kyle when it comes to you feel like nobody's going to listen to you, this could be a reason as to why you might want to consider coming forward so it doesn't happen to somebody else. So be brave. I know it's hard for a lot of people in any situation, whether it's sexual assault or anything else. 
Sometimes we gotta know when, when to be brave. So, so yeah, I'll say that. Yeah, I think when I when I talk about the individuals that I want to be brave, I want leadership in organizations to be brave. That's my challenge to them. When presented with information like this, follow up on the shit and act quickly. Like, that's the craziest thing. They could have did anything. Like, I'm kind of grossed out realizing, wait a sec, you mean Kyle Beach reported this shit and he's got to be at a at an event with this same motherfucker that assaulted him? Realize how sickening that is? You don't you don't ran you don't ran it up the co- chain of command. And you got to deal with the motherfucker that has assaulted you. Like shit is all good. That's the repulsive part. I mean, it's all repulsive. But that's a really impulsive repulsive part of it to me is that he whatever process he was told to follow, he did. And Infrastructure, leadership of the Blackhawks let him down. Infrastructure and leadership of the Blackhawks let themselves down. And that's why those Stanley Cups don't shine as much as they should today. Well, that may be a discussion for a different topic, but um, let me ask you something here. Should Should we say allegedly when it comes to this stuff? Because... When it comes to Aldrich, when it comes to what happened with Kyle, not the not the kid in Michigan, um, well, only because there was no there was no conviction, nothing like that. And and I, one thing I, I I feel like I was struggling to decide for, and I put this out here in the report that again the law law firm submitted to Blackhawks, they did mention that there was a female witness when it comes to all this who was in the apartment at the same time same time frame as Kyle Beach and Aldrich when the, the assault happened. Well, supposedly she was there prior to the assault happening. But according to the report, the woman, the woman was found, and according to her report of what happened, what she says makes Aldrich's story inconsistent and Kyle's inconsistent when it comes to certain aspects of what each of them said. So I will say that, just putting, out, putting that out there, that. It's, it's, yeah. Just I'm gonna leave it at that. So that's that's why I kind of wonder: should we be saying allegedly when it comes to this? Because we, again, there was no charge criminally, anyway. So I don't know. Just I don't know. What, what do you think about that? Should we be saying allegedly when it comes to this? Jason, my response is quack quack. If it looks like a duck, it sounds like a duck. Hell, it even smells like a fucking duck. It's a fucking duck. I mean, that's a lot of people having to resign. So, to me, Eve, eat. Does does the fact that he was convicted of a crime later necessarily mean that he is 100% guilty on this? Not necessarily, but motherfuckers definitely did enough for somebody to report it and they did nothing. Right, and that's really what they got in trouble for is not doing anything, you know? Because right. they, even if they had, had they done something, it could have been determined back then, was there a crime happened or didn't? Trial, maybe, who knows? But because they didn't do anything, there you go. So yeah, because That's they gave him the option, they gave him the option to resign, as opposed to looking into it. What the? F- now I, I'm not a. I've never been technically a part of HR, but I have to imagine that that's probably a mistake on somebody's part to give somebody that option. To to avoid a possible investigation into a possible crime, by giving him the option to quit. 
I, I, I don't know any other employer that'd be willing to do that. But yeah, could be wrong. Yeah, that that's just where I land. Enough enough happened for people to absolutely do more than what they did. Agreed. And so that concludes our first segment. Coming up in the second segment, we're going to be talking about some of uh, these potential uh, ballots that are coming in today since it's an off election year. Coming up next on Car Park Bros.